Well, welcome to Shoreline Conversations. This is our fourth episode where we're diving into tactics. I'm Thomas. I produce the podcast. I know I haven't really uh, uh, said this outright, but but uh, during the um, shelter in place, we are recording remotely. And Cole, our usual host, uh, is taking a, is taking a break. He'll be back after this, but. It's just simpler to uh, to just have two people in the recording, but um, Cole will be back. Don't worry for all of you wondering what happened to Cole. He didn't just silently slip away. Uh, <laughs> we're just doing the best we can with all the uh, regulations, trying to be safe, trying to be smart. So uh, so uh, expect him back in the future. But right, when we say Cole's not here, we don't mean he left Earth. Yes, yes. He's not he, here he, on the podcast hosting. Right, exactly. Yes, exactly. All right, so we're uh, we're in uh, the fourth week of tactics. We're in our fourth tactic, which um, I'll actually just have you uh, uh, kind of go over. What's uh, what's our fourth tactic here? Well, we're going to look at something called that uh, Greg Kokel, the founder of Tactics, calls taking the roof off, and he's really leveraging the. Um, the principle of reductio ad absurdum, or also known as argumentum ad absurdum. And it's a principle that is ancient. Uh, Xenophanes uh, of ancient literary renown, say 500 plus BC, is the first known usage of this technique when in a satirical poem, he criticized the Greek author Homer. And from then on, uh, we know it was used widely by Plato, uh, Aristotle himself uh, later on, and Socrates in the form that Socrates used ended up being called Socratic logic, which all attorneys learn and critical thinkers learn and philosophy students learn. And one use of Socratic logic and our viewers or listeners may be uh, familiar with is you break something down into its logical components to find out by the end if it has merit or if it's defeated. Got it. Okay. So that so, so Kokel has installed this into the uh, apologetics theme. So that's how we're studying it now. So we're we're aspiring to be uh, Aristotle, Socrates. Just you know, after the end of this podcast series, we can expect to kind of be on that level, right? I think everybody's going to be on that level going forward. We're going to see it spread throughout our region. People are going to not know it hit them. Beautiful. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's interesting. So, so it sounds like you were uh, throwing out some Latin for us. Reductio ad absurdum, um, reduced to the absurd. So, um, right. uh, explain uh, in a little more depth how we go about doing that. What's that look like? In, in a practical conversation or a debate? Well, when we would use it if, is if someone expresses a particular point of view that piques our interest, intrigues us, or on the very uh, utterance of it, we think, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense, or that seems based on a false premise or something. We're curious about it. And so we're going to use this technique because we want to find out First off, is this an assertion? In other words, it's just a claim somebody's making because they think it. Or is it actually an argument that they've constructed over time? And we don't find out unless we ask questions. Right. So we're going to ask questions. And in uh, reductio ad absurdum, or as Kukul, Kukul calls it, taking the roof off, we're actually going to adopt the person's view and say, all right, for discussion's sake, argument's sake, let's go with your view, and now let's write it out. Let's see where it takes us. Beautiful. And we do that by asking question after question to uh, bring it to light, to bring it more into clarity, their view into clarity. And what we're thinking as we do this is we're going to expose either the false premise it's based on or the absurdity of the notion, period. Got it. So that's what taking the roof off or reductio ad absurdum does. That's its goal. Okay, so you mentioned um, you mentioned kind of the goals of that right at the end there. Uh, explain briefly what a false premise would be. Okay. It's a statement that somebody makes and they make it as though it's a truth. 
Got it. But it just doesn't ring true. So you begin asking questions to expose it. So it's not even the argument itself. It's actually no. what the argument is based on is false. It's uh, it sounds a little sneaky. Maybe maybe unintentional. <laughs> Usually, probably unintentional. But because uh, you're you can't argue with something when uh, the information it's based on isn't even true, right? I mean that right. that will lead into more absurdity. Is that is yes. that the thought there? Yes, it is. And the way you would do this is you'd start with the initial Columbo questions. The first thing you want to do is get clarity on the statement, get the person to own the statement, and then put the statement on the table. Got it. So you kind so of take it for a walk. Right. If someone says, all churches steal the people's money. So hmm. our churches steal people's money. I've heard that claim. I would say, all right, first of all, what do you mean by churches? What do you mean by steal? Going back through the other tactics. Yeah. What do you mean by which people wear? And have them lay it out on the table, because that is a is a truth claim they're making. Mm -hmm. But there's a it's a premise, right? And so I I instant instantly know right away there's something wrong with this. That's why I would engage. So I'd ask those initial questions so that the person hears themselves speak it out again, and if they confirm yes, that's what I'm saying, I want it on the table for reference back to it. And then once it's established, they've put their statement on the table. I'm going to take it for a drive with them. I'm going to say, all right, can I ask you some questions about this? Some more questions. Since you've said this, what if this happens? What about that? What if this happens? What do you mean by that? And let's go with your statement as though it's true. Mm -hmm. And the idea is as we walk, walk the statement forward as though it's true, the absurdity of it will grow increasingly become obvious and apparent. Right. And it sounds like uh, we're getting into um, implications now. So yes. once you start taking an idea for a drive, as though it's true, you start to run into um, implications. Uh, if this is true, then, you know, this will also be true. Uh, how do you how do you navigate that through the conversation where you start to I like I do like the image that you're in a car and you're driving and you're 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 looking out at the scenery and you're like, well, how do we explain this one? How do we explain this one? So right. take, take us through how implications play a role in uh, in taking an idea for a drive. Well, let me let me uh, let me go with the one I stated. Churches just steal people's money. So I'm going to take it for a drive by saying, so you're saying, get clarity. You're saying churches, meaning established churches. Is that what you mean? Yes. Okay. And do you mean uh, steal, meaning they take it without permission? Or they take it under fraudulent circumstances? If so, describe those to me. What do you mean uh, by steal? What, what ways do they steal it? And do you mean all churches, some churches? Do you mean Christian churches? Do you mean Baha'i churches, Jehovah's Witnesses churches? Mm -hmm. And and based on their answer, you ask more questions. So the odds are they're not going to say, yes, all of them do. Because if they did, I'd say, okay, can we do another initial Columbo question? How did you get to that conclusion? Right. Yeah. How did you arrive there? And and you've you've said it's all churches. How did you get there? And so what let's say for discussion's sake, they just say, no, it's Protestant churches. Okay, Protestant churches. You say they steal. By steal, do you mean they take it uh, with the people unaware they're taking it? They lie about how they get it? They do it under fraudulent circumstances or definitions? In other words, it's literally stealing. All right. And when you mean people, do you mean people who just attend the church? Do you mean they go out into the community and steal it? How do you mean they do this? Mm -hmm. By what manner do they do it? And then I would ask bigger questions like, do you think churches then should never ask for money? Right. And do you think, how do you think churches would operate if they didn't ask for money? What's your idea of how they would continue to operate? And see, once we get to that point, 
they might, what they might begin to see, I would hope they begin to see is, well, they're not going to operate. And will it expose something they're thinking underneath it? Like there shouldn't be any churches Mm -hmm. or something like that. Which they might actually believe deep down, but maybe they know that that's, they know that that's absurd. And so they're not saying it. So they create kind of this uh, facade. Is that fair to say? It's fair to say. And then, then I would ask even more questions the way I'm wired, given the theme we're in. So you think that churches concoct schemes to steal from people. And if they see us, they'll say, all people are, are any people resistant to their schemes. Um, and so tell me how you think churches arrived at a scheme so brilliant that people are unable to resist it. Right. And so I'm looking at every end of the statement and asking question after question after question and bringing it to light. Then I'd say, in your definition of stealing, do you think that um, there's ways churches can ask for money or none? Right. Let's start with that. Well, churches, sure, they should get some money. How would they go about getting that money? What are, are your ideas? about how they do it. So by now, if the person isn't exasperated with the questions, we've begun to see some of the absurdity of their statement. It just doesn't make any sense. So, but I'm doing it by asking questions on every angle and every aspect of this statement. Mm -hmm. So that's a way I would do it. So, so just so we're kind of parsing this correctly in our heads, um, there's multiple kind of that scenario that you laid out, um, which I think is probably a fairly realistic scenario. There's some, you know, uh, obviously we're creating a caricature, but uh, I, I think that that's a that's a belief I can see people having. Oh, my auto light just went out for people uh, uh, not watching the video. The, sorry about the lighting, sudden lighting change. Um, it's not related to Thomas's mood. <laughs> yes, it's not. <laughs> So, uh, so that 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 whole line of thinking, um, and you can plug in uh, any any kind of uh, argument. It doesn't have to be the specific sure. one, but w- uh, tell us which parts are the implications in that? Because it's not all implications, but you you ask questions enough until you arrived at implications. Like uh, w- one of them might be at the end where you said, "Well, then churches wouldn't exist." So if right. if we did what you think we should do, churches would not exist. That's an right. implication. Sure. So I guess I guess the uh, a better question might be, in general, how do we how do we uh, train our minds to find these implications? To to when you hear a statement, you're almost taking it logically through to the end there, and, and th- right. seeing okay, what might the implications be? of an argument. How do we change, uh, train our minds to pick these out? Because I feel like implications are one of the most powerful uh, um, things to really understand in this kind of conversation. Yeah. So I look at implications this way. Uh, in that statement we used, again, it is a caricature. Thank you for that term. I look at this. So so if I ask that question and someone has said, churches steal money and they fool people, I would ask them again, so is there anything about church's use of money that you approve of? Mm -hmm. And I I think we'd be hard pressed to find anybody that doesn't know of some beneficial thing some church is doing somewhere. So, So you're saying there are some things churches do with money that are helpful. What would happen if those churches didn't do that? What's your thinking? Mm -hmm. There's an outcome. There's an implication. What if the churches weren't in that area or that community? I might say, are you aware of the Sisters of Charity, for example? It's a parachurch related to the Catholic Church. Are you aware, aware of all the tremendous things they do, which require funding? Are you saying you'd be okay if they didn't do those things anymore? Uh, are you saying that people shouldn't be allowed to give to churches? 
Are you saying, you know, so so what would happen then if people wanted to freely choose to support a church? Are you saying they should not do that? Mm -hmm. Are you saying there's something wrong with that? So there's all kinds of implications wrapped around people's choice, people's desire to give, a church's ability to serve and help others as it's directed to do. So I would look at every piece of that and say, what are the implications of all three of them? Are there ways to ask for money or give money that don't meet your definition of stealing? Are there churches that you think are okay if they ex exist and or ones you've heard of or know about that you think would be all right if they exist? And you think people ought to be free to give money where they'd like to give. And can you think of any other institutions or any other endeavors where people should not give either? That you don't approve of how people ask for money or how money is solicited. Mm -hmm. So there we've listed all kinds of possible implications that if we were able to continue with someone in this argument would come to the light. And we could then move them around and say, what are we going to do with all these pieces on the table now? Yep, yep. So... This same concept with our own beliefs. So we're talking about, um, we're on the question asking side of this conversation. So flipping the coin a little bit, how can this be useful in uh, maybe doing something alone or, or we talked about uh, in a previous episode, maybe finding a trusted friend to, to have these conversations with and to kind of sharpen each other. How can we use this kind of thing to really refine our own beliefs or, or strengthen our own beliefs where we're finding, um, you know, nobody has uh, the perfect set of beliefs, right? Even us as Christians where we have uh, things that we all agree on and, and core, core beliefs, there's always these little nuances that either tradition or something sneaks in, or maybe we just don't have a complete, maybe we do believe the right thing, but it's just not the complete understanding of it. How can we use kind of this reductio ad absurdum? How can we use this kind of the kind of questions that you described asking this person in our own beliefs to uh, pinpoint if we have any uh, uh, implications ourselves that we're not considering? And and is that useful to even do, or is that just a way to slowly unravel, <laughs> drive yourself crazy? That's a that's a very intriguing question, Thomas. Uh, one thing that comes to mind when you mention that, I think of a position, say I held the position as an attender or member of a church that, you know, 80% of all the money this church gets should be put into foreign missions to all the parts of the world where poor people live and need help and they need to hear about Jesus and they need infrastructure, 80%. And I've met people who believe that, but say it's a belief I held. Mm -hmm. If I applied this reductio ad absurdum process to my own belief about my church, then I'd have to ask myself the same Colombo type questions. What do I mean by 80% of which funds, all funds? What do I mean by foreign missions? Which ones? What would happen to the church I'm a member of if that happened? If they made the change in the next 30 days, am I willing to look at the outcome of the changes that that would generate? Do I believe that's biblical? Right. Where What would my theological support be for making that sudden shift? Am I willing to give up membership if they don't? Right. Do I believe my pastor, no longer believe my pastor is led by the Holy Spirit because he doesn't agree? I got to ask myself all these questions. Yep. And you, you know, don't and necessarily I pay attention to the answers. Right. And you're not necessarily going to end up saying, "Oh, well, I've done this and I and I've realized that this belief can't hold water, so uh, I don't care about missions at all anymore." No, that, I'm that's not. not that's not what happens there. You might it's maybe a matter of changing that percentage number, right? Right. And maybe a matter yeah, changing the percentage. But if I don't ask the questions, I might be at risk of not seeing the implications, the potential outcome. And, and then if I was a person of influence in a church and, I, and was not willing to look at the implications and outcome in a thoughtful, prayerful process, I might, I might execute behaviors that are harmful to the church. 
trying to get my way. And that happens all the time, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's one of the worst outcomes I can imagine is disruption and division in the church. Indeed. So um, you mentioned, uh, just take us through quickly, um, taking the roof off is what Greg Kukul calls this. And he uses this analogy of, of a house. Uh, take us through that real quick, just um, just to kind of deepen our understanding. Give us kind of, it, it's a, it, I feel like it's a helpful visual for this tactic. What, is, what does he mean by taking the roof off or taking the walls? <laughs> Did I mix that it's up? Take the roof off. You okay. got it. Taking the roof off. <clears throat> he, he selected the house imagery uh, for a good reason. The roof is there, period. The roof is the claim. Um, if there's no argument after doing, after taking the roof off, there's no argument, then what you see is there's no support for the roof. There isn't. It just sits there on the ground. That's an assertion. Because through the questioning process, what's been revealed is there's no support or what lawyers would call, you know, a valid argument there. So the roof cannot be supported. Got it. So that's what you do. You take the roof off and you see, are there walls? Is there substance to this? And, and so... Yeah, that's yeah, the mental ahead. imagery we're looking at. It's not a car. It's not you drive the car off the cliff, but you don't take the roof off the car because <laughs> that would be unconvertible, which is equally valuable. Exactly. Sometimes, <laughs> mostly, most of the time, even more valuable. Yes, sir. So it's about a house. Beautiful. And so we're. Uh, I just feel like that's important to understand. In that, that's actually what we're trying to build when we talk about questioning ourselves. I feel like the image of a house, does this have walls? Does this have a foundation? Like we talked about the uh, the premise before, right. having a, making sure you have a true premise, making sure the whole thing that it's based on is true. So you've got the foundation, the walls, and then uh, the, the roof is, when you're building, it's the last thing you arrive at, right? So the claim right. should follow a bunch of other stuff. I just personally thought that was a really uh, a cool um I like it too. And I'm, I'm uh, in mind of a line I heard in a detective series my wife and I watched recently. And this, uh, this veteran detective is grooming a newcomer. And the newcomer's frustrated. They're not getting anywhere with a case. And the detective says, if all of the answers you're looking for are unsatisfying or not coming, no matter what angle you take, maybe better recheck the premise. Mm-hmm. And I, and I believe that. Yep. So, so that's what we're looking at with taking the roof off is we see it's about the rock and the shoe. Remember, I can get a rock in my own shoe. Yeah. And the hard part is when dealing with this, we're also, we, we may also deal with in ourselves and others, what's called confirmation bias. There are people who will make an assertion. They may let you or be with you as you engage in a taking the roof off process and in the end, reject the rock in their shoe and hold to their belief regardless. Right. And that that's not uncommon. It's not uncommon at all. Uh, in fact, and uh, we can kind of wrap up on this kind of thing, but confirmation bias, I feel like is uh, is huge today. <laughs> with uh, <laughs> I'll try to tread softly here. Um, Careful. <laughs> <laughs> but but with the internet uh, uh, and the ability to um, be in such large communities, um, they're uh, uh, a lot of the confirmation bias communities or whatever. Uh, they're you know pejoratively called echo chambers. I'm sure people have heard that uh, that phrase before because you're you're finding people that already agree with you to just keep keep it echoing over and over and everybody feels good about themselves. Um, and I, I feel like with the, with the internet today and social media and, and there's great things and wonderful things about those, I love the internet, um, but the danger is that those echo chambers, that confirmation bias seems to be more uh, easier to slip into than ever. Is there anything we can do for ourselves as we're engaging in these conversations and reflecting on our own beliefs to um, be wary 
of uh, confirmation bias in ourselves? You know, even that last statement, I would say, yes, we must be wary of confirmation bias in yes. ourselves. But, you know, that's a hard thing to do because, number one, we don't like instability. We don't like uncertainty. Most people don't. Mm -hmm. And people want to belong. What's um, to reference what you're saying about in today's times, I'll tread softly as well. Humans have certain basic needs, and it's part of our developmental uh, journey as we grow from infancy on. One is to belong. Sometimes it's easier to just sign off on a bias, reject truth, reject input, because you have others who've also signed off on the bias, and they're telling you how awesome you are. So, so you just shut the door on truth and accept the warmth of belonging. Mm. And I, I see that more and more, and you can do it far quicker with, with what I would say is the two-dimensional illusion of belonging on the internet. Um, it, it's a facsimile of, I think, in many ways, but it's enough that people bite. So how do I stop it in myself? Well, number one, uh, I'm a believer, right? I'm a Christian, and I have a Christian accountability in my life. I can put that on the table with friends, and I could say, you know what? Can you watch for something in me? If you ever see me sort of solidifying out of a theme that now is in total disarray with new truth available and scriptural contradiction, would you confront me? Would you rebuke me? The Bible calls us to rebuke one another and be rebuked. Mm -hmm. So I, I have to make a doorway for a rebuke in my life. Every Christian does, and it's not the most warm, comfy thing at times, but it's a Christ like. A pattern. Um, and so we're called to it. And that would be my first, my first go-to would be scripture calls me to look at myself and to allow others to confront me. And I would just put confirmation bias on the table with all the other stuff I already let people rebuke me on, which they do eagerly. Yes. And yeah, and especially as believers in a church, um, it's, uh, I mean, the church itself can become that echo chamber and having people that you trust and, uh, and being open to have conversations and ask questions. Um, yeah. I know for, for my generation and uh, generations younger than me, especially, um, there's been these studies where uh, uh, authenticity is like the, the highest value. Um, and being able and comfortable to ask questions and not have those things um, snuffed out, but doing it, doing so in an environment like a church, uh, it, there's a balance there, right? I mean, there's uh, there's a balance to be had into where we're not afraid to bring those questions up, but we're also not afraid to say, "Well, this is what I believe, and this is this is where I do belong," and so I'm going yeah. to belong here, and I'm not gonna, you know, the the way to defeat an echo chamber isn't to eternally be this lone wolf on the mountain, never uh, agreeing with anything anybody else says, right? There, there's, right. A, there's a balance there. Um, I guess, yeah, the, yeah. You, you have a background in um, marriage and family therapy and counseling. Um, I, I would imagine you've had some, some interesting things to say about balance. Do you, can you take us through that a bit? Well, I, I can. Um... Here's the way it works whenever I'm sharing about balance or any therapist of experience is sharing. We can all do a conference, a chat, or write something about balance. And everybody will nod their heads in agreement because who's going to say, I dislike balance. I think things should be extremely slanted to one side or the other. No one's going to say it. Mm -hmm. Even those who do that aren't going to say it. But balance, the idea of gaining balance in one's life, uh, takes on new meaning when one is out of balance. And when one is out of balance, it means something isn't working or it's working badly. There's distress, there's strain, there's pain, there's difficulty. Mm -hmm. That's when the opportunity to value balance and seek balance is uh, uh, most accessible. We call it the window of pain or the window of opportunity. It doesn't stay open long. So I always advocate for balance, but I don't know anybody who doesn't really. Right. Easier so said than done sometimes, though. It's easier said than done, like most things. 
that 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 then leads to a whole other conversation, which we won't do. But it's all about how does change happen? Right, right, yeah. Last last couple of things were kind of a off topic, rapid fire, but I thought they were uh, they were interesting, and you know, the uh, as conversations do sometimes, they're a meandering path. <laughs> yes, uh, colorful and full of uh, nuances and indeed stuff like that. Well, thank you so much, Dennis, uh, for for talking to us today. Uh, and we'll be back with another uh, one. We'll probably do a couple at a time next time, I think. Um, but yeah, so we're we're uh, we're we're building our little house, making uh, making sure our own houses can withstand the storms of reductio ad absurdum, and we're learning how to. Beat on the door of others, I guess. <laughs> no, 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 no. We're putting a rock in their right, shoe. Right, right. That's what I, a mailbox. <laughs> We're just putting a rock in their mailbox. No, the analogies are getting they're they're getting all mixed up. <laughs> all right, Dennis. Thanks a ton. Right, we'll a, see you next week. It's a great week. time as always. See you next time. Indeed. See you guys. Whether you're watching on our YouTube channel or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe to hear more of our weekly episodes. Thanks for listening.